Welcome to Evidence Base, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about toxic striving with Dr. Paula Friedman Diamond, author of Toxic Striving. Paula is a licensed clinical psychologist, certified intuitive eating counselor, and owner and clinical director of Humankind Psychological Services, where she specializes in treating anxiety, perfectionism, and disordered eating. She regularly contributes to Psychology Today in her online series, Fat is Not a Feeling. She has been a featured expert for the New York Times, Oxygen, Allure, Reebok, and Bark Technologies. She regularly provides mental health advocacy, education, and engaging content to her audience on Instagram and TikTok. Hi, Paula. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I was really excited to read your book, and I love the term toxic striving. Can you talk about what that is and how it's harmful? Yeah. So for a long time in my clinical practice, I didn't really have language for this phenomenon that I was seeing, but I specialize in working with um, anxious, high achieving, people pleasers, perfectionist types. And I noticed that a lot of them were presenting with both really high anxiety and a lot of like pressure and self-criticism and disordered eating and body image concerns. And I just thought that overlap was really interesting. And what I realized is that, and it's something I personally have experience with and relate to, it comes from the, they, both of those issues, disordered eating and anxiety kind of can come from the same place, which is this, this tendency, this sort of combination of nature and nurture where someone might be more predisposed to striving and like really like feeling in control and be really goal oriented, but then also get messaging from the outside world that like you have to do those things. You have to be really disciplined. You have to have self-control. And that's the only way to have success in life. And those two things can kind of come together to create this like psychological prison, basically, where you're striving all the time and you never feel like you're getting anywhere that you can feel proud of or that you can rest at. And it just sort of becomes this like toxic cycle. Yeah. And it really, like what you said, it comes down to, for both of those overlapping things, that it's about control. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. And it's interesting because I feel like on the surface, sometimes people don't see them as related. But even what I find is that for a lot of people, and this isn't true for everyone, so it might not resonate for every single person. But like, a lot of times, even if let's say someone's like the things that you beat yourself up over tend to be more around like your work performance or how much you got done that day, your productivity, there's also sometimes this piece of the puzzle that's like, and I didn't even work out or, and I ate terribly or, and I gained weight or whatever. There's, there's a piece of it that relates to your physical appearance. And then for other people, the physical appearance might be more front and center where the the things that they beat themselves up over are diet exercise, the way they look, or, you know, I'm aging and I, whatever, I, I have these, whatever, I'm getting gray hair. I need to take care of that. But there's also this larger piece of that that's, related to your overall like self-image and how well you think you're doing as a person. So the pathways then look a little different for everyone, but I find that they're often two sides of the same coin. Yeah, absolutely. And one statement that you had in your book that really resonated with me was you start off by talking about the target is always moving. Can you say more about what that means? Yeah, it's something I've lived myself and I think probably a lot of people can relate to, which is like, sometimes you'll have this goal in your head and get really stuck on it and and just think, okay, if I just get to this, then I'm going to be good. Like then I can feel satisfied with myself. Then I can feel like I've, I've done enough or I've proven myself as, you know, successful or worthy, or, you know, I've, I've, I've reached this achievement. And then you get to that thing and your brain doesn't really let you rest or relax or celebrate it. It's like, all right, well, what's next, you know? So it's like, I mean, you know, for example, I just want this promotion. Once I get this promotion at work, I will feel finally like I'm smart enough and like I, you know, my hard work has paid off and I can just sort of like rest on my laurels. And then you get the promotion and maybe you celebrate it for a second, but then it's like, all right, what's next? Like you've you've moved on to the next goal. You don't, it doesn't really satisfy you. It kind of feels like this chronic emptiness and like the target's always moving because it's it's never enough to feel like, all right, now I can just enjoy my life. And what's interesting, and we can get into this when we talk about wellness and hustle culture, but even the target of what is like the the symbol of success is moving based on what popular culture is saying makes you a success or 
makes you cool or or any of those things. So even in how our culture is playing out, that target is always moving as well. That's so true. I think that like diet trends are a good example of that where, you know, one day or one period of time, it's like, oh, you shouldn't be eating carbs. Carbs are bad. And, you know, before that it was like the low fat era. And so it's like, as soon as you feel like, all right, I've kind of figured out my eating and now I'm following this, this healthy lifestyle or whatever I'm supposed to be doing, it changes, you know, in the larger cultural context. And it's like, oh, well, that's not good enough anymore. I think our minds kind of diminish successes or achievements as soon as we reach them sometimes too. So it's like, I know for myself, when I wrote my, my last book, it was like, as soon as I, and I, and I worked really hard on it and it took me a long time and I put a lot of energy into it. But as soon as it was out, I, my brain was like, so what? It wasn't that hard. And it's like, well, yeah, it was, it was actually hard, you know, but, but it immediately is like, once it's over, it erases all of like the work you put in and, and the effort and just kind of downplays it. And I think the unique thing about your work is you're combining acceptance and commitment therapy and intuitive eating. How do these two concepts come together to really help? What I love about both of these models is that they're kind of about shifting your focus from looking for messaging and expectations from the outside world for guidance on what to do to going inward and and trusting your own inner wisdom to basically like figure out what's authentic to you and what's meaningful to you. So intuitive eating obviously is more focused on your relationship with food and eating and your body, but the principles of it, I think really dovetail nicely with acceptance and commitment therapy in that there's a lot of focus on giving yourself unconditional permission. They call it an intuitive eating unconditional permission to eat whatever foods your body's driving you towards and craving to honor your hunger, to respect your fullness, to recognize like that your body's going to tell you what it needs and to not need to impose all of this external stuff. And the idea that like, just like it, they say an act, what you resist persists. The more you try not to have something, the more you try not to let yourself have a certain food or something, the more out of control you're going to feel around that food. And an act, we know, the more that you try to not experience a certain feeling or not think a certain thought, the more that thought or that feeling consumes you, the more power it has. And so in both models, there's a lot of shift towards giving yourself the chance to practice acceptance, to, to lean into whatever naturally arises, allow it to be there, even if you don't like it, even if you don't want it, and that that's how the power gets taken away and it sort of like neutralizes that experience. So it can be, I don't know, it can be a little abstract, but I think that, you know, I see a ton of overlap and then I, I find that that deprivation that we do, that that's sort of such a common part of, of people who are toxic strivers is not only do we often deprive ourselves of whatever foods bring us joy or whatever we're craving, but we also deprive ourselves of the ability to really experience pleasure and satisfaction because it feels like it's wrong. We feel like we're being lazy or self-indulgent or selfish or something like that. You talk about wellness culture and hustle culture, and then you use the term that both of these, you know, cultures have brainwashed us. Can you talk about how that happens? Yeah. Yeah. I think it happens probably through a variety of of inputs and it's different for everybody, but, you know, we're not born thinking that it's, that we have to be a certain way in order to be worthy of love or belonging or in order to be considered good, right? We, We get hit with all of this conditioning for better or worse. And some conditioning I think is, you know, helpful and necessary. You know, if you are never guided into anything, how do you ever learn how to be and, you know, develop your own values and your own moral compass and that sort of thing. So we do need some guidance, of course, when growing up, but a lot of times we get taught to silence our true needs and desires and to really just focus on pleasing the outside world, whether it's our parents and caregivers or community at large or like to fit social expectations of how you're supposed to be as as a woman or as a professional or, you know, whatever your role might be in whatever way you're trying to get validation. And a lot of times we get so caught up because it feels so important that I, I need to fit these standards that are that were taught to me, not things that I came up with on my own as meaningful and important, but things that were taught to me. We get so caught up in chasing those things that we don't really ever stop to ask ourselves, like, am I satisfied? Is this what I really want to be chasing? 
do I like my life? Do I like myself? You know? And, and so, yeah, I, I guess we kind of, yeah, we end up brainwashed into thinking like, these are our tickets for happiness and validation and an enjoyable life and a rewarding life. And I mean, that doesn't have to be the case. <laughs> and that's often not the case. A lot of times, you know, you kind of wake up one day and you're like, why am I chasing after this goal? Or I, I just feel kind of chronically empty and I can't figure out why. And sometimes that's what's underneath is that it's like, well, I'm pursuing these accolades or I'm pursuing this, you know, this body or I'm, I'm pursuing these things that I was taught to associate with success or lovability or, you know, worth. And I don't find those things personally meaningful deep down. So it can just be sort of, I think, you know hard sometimes to recognize, especially because like you, the messages are still coming in from the outside world, you know? So if you decide, for example, I, I, I know I keep coming back to like body stuff, but I think this is a good, you know, just kind of highlights it really easily. If you decide, you know what, I've been trying to lose the same 10 pounds my whole life. It's not happening. I'm tired of focusing on this. I want to have brain space to dedicate to other things that I care about, my relationship with my kids or, you know, hobbies, interests, my job, whatever it might be, literally anything else. I don't want to be thinking about what I'm eating all the time. And you start to move away from that as a priority because it's like, it's not really important to me. You still might have struggles where you bump up against all of this messaging. That's like, you should be losing weight. That size is not okay. So it's, it's, there's, it's hard. It's hard to stand in your truth and to really stay solid when you're still going to get hit with that messaging. Like that doesn't just go away. So I want to say a couple of things about what you just talked about and talk a little personally as well. One thing that has been interesting is seeing how TikTok has kind of taken over, you know, popular culture. And like right now, and I have to remind myself, like all these influencers are suddenly getting skinny and it's like possibly Ozempic, but it's hard not to be like, well, this plus size person who was being very positive about being plus size is suddenly dropping weight and it, it like sends mixed signals to your brain almost. And I find myself thinking about that as I see these people who I've followed for years who are proud and plus size shrinking and then being really like not talking about why they're shrinking. So then people are like, Oh, like you must be working hard and you know, like putting in the time to, you know what I mean? There's definitely like, a shift going on with the body trends right now, which has effect. It, it can affect you really deeply. It can make it be like, well, I thought it was okay. Cause we look of course to the outside world for validation and for like, am I doing okay? Am I doing the right things? And if suddenly what's considered the right thing is changing, it's like, Oh, well, do I have to change with this? And, you know, and also like society, like for a very, very, very long time, the world has been kinder to people in smaller bodies and like the, you know, society has been constructed in a way that rewards people in smaller bodies. So it's understandable to want to chase after that privilege. And, you know, it's like, I like to think of it as systems kind of change and, and fits and starts and waves and not like overnight all at once. Right. So it's like, I think the system has shifted since, you know, maybe 40 years ago, but it's like backsliding a little, like it's not a linear kind of change and we're in maybe a backslide with all this Ozempic stuff, but it's like, you know, maybe it's idealistic of me to think it's not, it's, it's not, it's still moving in that direction. I think in the long term that we're kind of waking up to how oppressive and messed up it is to have this be this, like to, to have a world that is structured in a way where like certain bodies are held up on a pedestal and others are demonized, you know? it's not linear and that's really hard and that's really hard to contend with, you know, like just as an individual person, like living your life, you know, it's like, well, what does this mean for me and my relationship with my body? And that's where you really have to like come back into yourself and be like, what matters to me? Do I want to be spending my time and energy on this stuff? And it's not an easy choice and it's not an easy, cho I think, you know, the, the fewer privileges you have and body privileges you have, like the harder the choice it, is or can be because it's it's like who doesn't want to go out in the world and have things be easier and be treated be well you know if let's say you're really into the body positive stuff and you've been championing it for a long time and you find yourself having 
mixed thoughts around, well, do I want to pursue weight loss or what, where am I with all of this now? I thought I was on one side and I'm now I'm sort of unsure that it's okay to go through that process and to grapple with it at different phases of your life. And I don't know anyone who, even if they've never struggled with an eating disorder, disordered eating or whatever, who hasn't had some type of com- complexity in their relationship with their body, because bodies are inherently changing from birth till death. So it's like, you know, every time it changes, there's a process that you might have to go through around that, even if you go through it in a way that's a little bit like less fraught than someone else's process. It's still, we're still always having to adapt and and accept and cope. And, and that's not easy, you know? I, uh, I struggled with this a lot in the last year with my body. I, um, I had cancer last year. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, which fundamentally changed my body. My tumor was pressing my trachea. So I actually ended up on a feeding tube for about four months and getting all my nutrition. I couldn't swallow anything. And so like at one point I was talking to a therapist about how like you know, past me who was in a bigger body would have loved to have lost, you know, I lost 90 pounds during this because I literally couldn't eat. And uh, I mean, the minute I started eating again, I gained, of course, a bunch back because my body was in starvation mode and like all this stuff. But it was so interesting going through that and realizing like one, the appreciation I was lacking for my body pre-cancer, like yes, I lost this weight and past me would have loved to have lost it, but I was so weak. Like I missed my strong body, even if it was a bigger body. And it's just interesting, like to have your body change one so rapidly and be so out of your control. And I was just like, I would love to get to a point where I just don't think about my body. And so this intuitive eating has been really um, important to me through this as I came back to eating, but it was just such a drastic example of this, like, thinking about my body and comparing it to other like people who were going through cancer treatment, I was like, well, they don't have like neuropathy in their feet, like, which I still can't walk very well with mine. But like that comparison even applies during like cancer treatment, which is just crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It sounds like such a jarring experience, you know? And like you said that for it to even come out in this where you're like fighting for your life situation that, that, I mean, it's so insidious, these like beliefs we have about our bodies and how they're supposed to look that even in a situation where it's life or death, it's, there's still thoughts and feelings and beliefs that are getting activated around, around body. And so what have these cultures, this wellness culture, this whole hustle culture, what has it done to our like core values? I think it's sold us a set of values as important the, like it's it's kind of instilled us with this yeah the set of values that we're taught to treat as the things that we care about and for some people it might align like there are people who genuinely value you know maybe pursuit of a certain aesthetic and that's authentic to them but for a lot of people it's not authentic and it's just the thing that we were taught to care about But if you stop and really go deep down and you're honest with yourself, it's like, do I really care about this? Is this really the most important thing to me? You know, when I'm at the end of my life, looking back, hopefully in a really long time, am I going to be like glad that these are the things I focused on? Am I going to wish there were other things that I was focusing on? And when we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times it's, it doesn't match up with hustle culture, wellness cultures, values, which are, you know, discipline, self-control, you know, aesthetic beauty, thinness, wealth, financial wealth, right? Like those are the things that we're taught matter the most by those cultural systems. Are those the things that matter the most to you? And if the answer is yes, the answer is yes. And like, keep living your life. You probably don't need my book, but you know, if If you're being honest with yourself, I think for a lot of people, it's not what matters. And then, you know, you kind of end up kind of feeling just like chronically unsatisfied or empty or just sort of like not ever like you're able to enjoy things or, or just like that sense of unworthiness. And if you can reorient yourself to what you actually care about, if you can get in touch with those values and 
like identify them for yourself. And then I think it's worthwhile to check in with yourself every so often and be like, are these still my values? Cause they can change. If you do that, then you have more of your own framework and your own compass for guiding how, how you want to move forward in your daily life, how you want to behave, how you want to treat other people, how you want to treat yourself, what you want to put your energy and your time and your resources into. And it tends to just sort of like be a lot more of a more fulfilling way of moving through the world. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Dr. Lindsay Gibson, author of Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. Growing up with emotionally immature parents can affect their adult children in several ways. Most of all, it affects the child's ability to trust themselves as adults and to see themselves as people of value who have healthy entitlements to respect and their own individuality. So join me on this adventure of self-discovery. For more details, go to adultchildrencourse.com. New Harbinger Online Courses, self-help for everyone. One common thing that happens for those of us predisposed to toxic striving is sort of those all or nothing thought patterns. Can you talk about what those are and why this is something common that we experience? Yeah, I think when someone has a tendency to really like control, like me, and it sounds like maybe you too, <laughs> like I, I, I just, I really like control. It makes me feel really soothed. And I think that's the case for most humans, but I think there's some of us that like, it's, that's more the case, maybe. We want formulas and we want categories and we want to like have like a life hack, right? Like a, like a method that's like a tried and true, this is the surefire way to get what I want to feel the way I want to feel. And, you know, that can show up as all or nothing thinking. So I have to like, I I have to always do this or this always happens or this will never be the case. And, you know, that can lend itself to a lot of rigidity and um, development of rules and ways that we're looking for mental shortcuts, but that end up backfiring and sometimes causing us a lot of distress and suffering really. Yeah. It's funny that you say the the rules. I want to talk about that. But I found a note in my phone from when I was sick and didn't know what was wrong with me. Like my only symptom was I literally couldn't breathe. Like I would hyperventilate walking to like the bathroom. But I found a note in my phone that was literally a list and I called it let's get out of my flop era. And it was like all these things I would do when I could breathe again. And I was like, why was that something I was like, that I was trying to control something, but I was like, how hilarious to look back at that with like (laughs) fresh eyes. And to know what was really going on had nothing to do with like your motivation or your, you know, yeah, I've, I've been there too. I mean, not, not in the same, same experience, but been there too with like, okay, I'm in a funk or I'm not, I'm not doing the things I want to be doing. I just need to make this like habit tracker. And every day I'm going to wake up at 6am and every day I'm going to have this for breakfast. And every day I'm going to start working at this time. And I'm going to take a break. Like, like I, you try to just really, if I just like make this more of a regimented thing, then I can like crack the code on why I'm struggling. I mean, first of all, it's also not sustainable. Like we're not machines. You can't just like program yourself to operate a certain way every day on repeat and never deviate from that. Cause you know, like our energy levels and our attention just kind of ebbs and flows and you have days where you're more productive and days where you're not, or you get sick and there's something totally beyond your control. So it's just like, it is, it's, it's almost like funny sometimes, like you're saying to realize, oh, wow, I tried to program myself like a computer and it, no wonder it didn't work. Like I had cancer. Nothing I did was going to change that. <laughs> like Exactly. So when we're looking at these rules that a lot of us make for ourselves, what are some red flags to look for? Yeah, I think, okay. Well, I think one thing to say about rules is that it's not really about like their content. So you know, let's say it's like, I feel like sometimes rules start with an idea of how to be. So like, I want to be a certain way, but then it's the way you impose it on yourself that makes it a rule. And so some red flags of that would be if it's phrased like as a demand. So words like I should, I need to, I can't, I have to, I must, 
it means that like there's no wiggle room for any flexibility. So if let's say like it's important to me to be a friendly person and that's not a rule in and of itself, but if the way that I impose that on myself is I have to always smile at everyone who walks in the door or I have to be nice to whatever, like I have to act a certain way at all costs, at all times, there's no opportunity to ever deviate from that without then like beating myself up. And it's, you know, again, we're nuanced and we have different, we have ebbs and flows to our needs and our attention and our energy. And it depends on the context. So like you want to have some, the ability for some flexibility. So phrasing as a demand, judgmentalness, or like it, it, it's, it's judgy, a rule is usually judgy. So it's like, you, you kind of get put in a category of good or bad or inferior or superior based on whether you follow it or not. So if the rule is I have to get up at 6 a.m. to work out before work and then I don't, then I'm bad if I don't. And it's like, you're not really a bad, you're not a bad person if you don't get up at 6 a.m. Like who cares, you know? But then that also goes into like, it's how it, it can tie your performance to your worth. So like, if I follow the rule, I'm, worthy of love, belonging, acceptance, good things in life. And if I don't, then I'm not. And so that's another, I think, like sneaky way that it can, a rule can kind of control you. It might make you, if it, also I think looking at how certain thoughts make you feel or certain rules, if if it makes you feel like you're inadequate or like you're a failure or it makes you feel guilty or anxious, then it's like a, usually it's a rules-based type of, of thought. And I think a lot of times rules, at least for me and a lot of people I work with trigger a sense of urgency. So it's like, if I don't follow this rule, I have to like figure it out right now. I need to, like, it kind of sends you into fix it mode if you deviate. So to go with the 6am workout thing, like, all right, I didn't wake up. I, I slept through my alarm. I didn't work out. Now I need to figure out how to like compensate for that, you know, as opposed to, if it was a more like the same thing, maybe it's important to me to get some movement in before I start my day. And so I try to wake up in the morning and do it before work, but I could approach that without a rules mindset. And if it doesn't happen, all right, maybe I needed sleep that day. And if it like, it's really about the way that you speak to yourself more so than the content itself. Yeah. And I feel like just for myself, like a lot of the times when you do phrase it in that rigid way, it sets you up for failure, which kind of perpetuates like the perfectionism in a way. Cause then, like you said, you're like, oh, I didn't do this. How do I fix this? How do I get better? And so it's like a, a vicious cycle really. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times like we are maybe taught that we can, that like the only way to get yourself to do something is to shame yourself into it. (laughs) And I I, I, you can't really shame yourself into growth, right? You have to have a little more compassion and flexibility and curiosity as to, okay, if I'm not doing this thing, I wonder what's going on. Could it be, it could be not that important to me. Could there be some barriers there? Like if you can look at it like that, rather than I'm bad, I failed. I'm such a loser. It's a lot easier to like come out of and figure out how you want to move forward. So, yeah, I used to have an Apple watch, you know, which urges you close the three rings every day. So that became like a rule. And I recently, after I was in remission, I switched over to an aura ring, which I love because it bases your activity goal on how you slept. And so I feel like it, it switches the narrative a bit, like what you're saying, like maybe I needed more sleep that morning. So I didn't get up to go. And I think just like that one little like shift in, in thinking about it makes it more one manageable and kinder. Yeah. And it, it, it considers you as like a whole person and not just, again, a machine that's supposed to just operate a certain way when you hit the button and and with no room for like nuance, you know, it's, some days you're hungrier, some days you're not, some days you have more energy, some days you don't, not even just some days, like some moments, <laughs> you know? I, so the, if you can like respect where you're at and honor it, it's a lot, it's just a more compassionate way of living, you know, I, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. In your book, there's a section about interceptive awareness. What are some ways that you can practice it in everyday life and why is it super necessary? Yeah. So most people know about 
you know, the five sensory systems, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, but we actually have more sensory systems like that are not as often talked about, I guess, in the mainstream. And one of those is our interoceptive awareness or our interoception. And that's our ability to perceive signals from within the body. So noticing when you have a full bladder, noticing when you're hungry, noticing when your heart rate increases or decreases. Um, all of those are things that we can perceive without necessarily having like the tactile, you know, it's coming from within the body. And so that's generally helpful because it helps us attune to a lot of our biological needs, you know, but it's not a lot of times it's something that in the name of discipline or self-control or striving, we will sort of like mute those signals and just get in the habit of not really paying attention to them until they're either screaming at us like, oh my God, I'm going to burst and pee my pants if I don't go to the bathroom right now or until there's consequences, you know? So, so I think it's really, it's just, it's a valuable source of, of wisdom from your body. It's information, you know, and generally it's helpful to have that information and then decide what you want to do with it. I think that it's not something that we're, we're taught to listen to, especially when it comes to hunger, fatigue, those kinds of signals. We're taught to sort of just like, if you're tired, drink another cup of coffee and perk up and get more work done. If you're hungry, maybe you're thirsty, actually, <laughs> you know, like we're taught to kind of just distort those signals if they seem inconvenient or if they seem like the, or if they go against the narrative or, of what we're taught we're supposed to be doing. So if I'm tired, you know, at 4 p.m., but I have more work that I should be doing, you know, quote unquote, instead of being like, well, maybe this, I've just kind of hit my limit for the day, or I need to go take a walk, or I need a nap, you know, my mind might tell me, no, just ignore it, push through, crank it out some more. And it's probably not going to be the best quality work. That's also how you burn out is just <laughs> habitually ignoring your signals. But I might do that anyway, because that's what I'm taught is like, the disciplined, respectful, respectable, admirable thing to do. But if you can listen to your signals, you also will have a lot less of the like crash and burn thing that comes from ignoring those things. Right. Right. And why, why are fullness and emotional coping so closely tied together? And for me, I know I always struggle to connect with my hunger cues, but what are some ways we can begin to reconnect that innate wisdom really? A lot of times if you're not ever really feeling full, you might not notice when you're hungry too. I think they kind of go hand in hand. So it comes back to, yeah, noticing what's going on in my body. What do I need? It's not necessarily that they're tied together, the, the fullness and emotional coping. I just think that a lot of people don't always think of fullness as serving both a, a physical and a psychological purpose, you know? So... I think that in our society, especially people socialized as female are taught to kind of be afraid of like pleasure and satisfaction. And if you're taught to ignore your hunger, you also don't know when you're hungry. So there's just like this kind of like overall disconnection happening from your body and from what you really need to feel like, all right, I've had enough. My body can relax now. I'm safe. I'm satisfied. I'm nourished. I can move on with my day till I have another signal that tells me it's time to nourish again. You know, I think you can start, especially if you are someone who maybe has, it's very loaded, like your association with hunger or fullness or your relationship with food. You don't have to start with those signals to get in touch with what's coming from your body. So you might start with something that doesn't feel as charged for you, like a full bladder or tiredness or even like just putting your hand on your heart or, or like feeling your pulse for like set a timer for 60 seconds and, and feel your pulse and notice that like sensation and then move your hand away so you don't have the tactile feedback anymore and see if you can still perceive the signal like faintly um and then same with like your well you can't do that with your bladder <laughs> the tactile feedback. noticing when you have the urge to go to the bathroom, noticing what it feels like once you've relieved it, noticing like the progression that comes where ah, I kind of have to pee, but I can wait. I don't, it's not like urgent to like, oh my gosh, I have to go right now. And then you can move into doing that with hunger and noticing what are the signals like for me? Cause they're a little bit different for everyone. You know, there, there's some common ones for a lot of people. It's a sensation of 
like once you get to a certain point in hunger, it's like a gnawing or a rumbling in your stomach or just, you know, a, a heartburn or mouth watering. For some people, it's that they can't focus as well or you find yourself thinking about food all of a sudden. It's usually a sign that it's like, oh, it's time for lunch, you know? So noticing what are the signals that are coming to me that are cluing me in to an unmet need from my body. And then noticing the progression, noticing like the spectrum of them, right? So when I'm mildly hungry, it's just this like little rumbling. And then as it progresses, and I don't condone ignoring hunger, but you might just notice like, all right, 10 minutes later, it's gotten to the point where, okay, it's time. I better go to the fridge, you know? So just noticing the different levels of it can also be useful and just tuning in recognizing earlier and earlier in the process too, because a lot of times people don't recognize that they're hungry till they're ravenous. And then that also can make it harder to recognize if you wait until you're in an extreme of hunger, then it also becomes harder to recognize fullness when you've reached it because you're you're not, you're, you're like so hungry, your body drives you to eat faster a lot of times. And it's, it's just a lot harder to stay attuned to yourself. So not that you need to also like recognize fullness at the perfect time, but usually it can get uncomfortable if you go beyond when you're full. So again, it's all about like meeting your needs in a way that's satisfying and that is like calming to your nervous system and then allows you to just move on with your day. Yeah. And when, when we've been throughout all this, we've talked about really like the brainwashing we've experienced by these wellness, hustle cultures, literally social media. As we're starting this journey to like heal from that, I feel like at least for me, it's hard to sort of one, trust my own intuition and two, like, you know, understand who I am. Like if I'm not doing these things, how how can we like start that process? I think that's such a good question. It's something I go through myself as well. This sort of identity crisis almost that comes where it's like, all right, well, if I'm not, you know, Paula, the girl who gets straight A's or, you know, like, who am I? And what does that mean about me? If I'm not the girl who's really into like fitness or it, like, if, if that's doesn't define me, what, what does? And I, I mean, I think that it can be fluid, I, I which is hard to sit with because we want like, we want categories. That's why we like the all or nothing stuff. Right. So it, I don't think you're defined by your values, but I think that that can be a good place to come to like, as your home base is like, these are the things that matter to me. This is, these are, this is what I want to emulate in my life. Maybe it's whatever warmth or compassion or, you know, whatever kindness or, honesty or whatever. And that doesn't mean you have to act that way all the time in every context because you won't, but just coming back to that can be useful. And then, yeah, allowing, allowing your needs and your preferences and your personality traits to be like fluid, which doesn't mean unstable, but it means just like fluid, I guess, you know, (laughs) it's like, I don't know. I feel like I'm um, generally like a positive kind of happy person, but am I always? No. And so if I'm not, does that mean I'm not me anymore? No, it Mm -hmm. just means this is the moment I'm in right now and it's going to come and go and it's not a cause for alarm. It's just, and I could change. And, you know, like, so I guess like allowing yourself to not get too attached. I think that's, that, that really goes with what you're bringing up that it's like, sometimes I think what's really hard is that we get so attached to these aspects of ourself. And that's like such a, tentative act, right? Is like this attachment to the conceptualized self can really create a lot of suffering because there's no fluidity, there's no flexibility, and we are gonna change whether it's by choice or not. <laughs> so Yeah, I, I will say I really struggled with this during treatment because I self-identify as one older sister, you know, I take care of people. It was really challenging. My husband became my full-time caretaker, essentially. Like I couldn't do anything on my own, let alone he had to help me walk to the bathroom with my feeding tube. Like, and it went from a complete shift of, I used to make sure all the laundry was done. I used to make sure like, like I'd have a partner, but like I would make sure of these things and like assign them to us. Like I was sort of like the, 
you know, the, the caretaker of the house, it completely shifted. And like having to let my little sister comfort me emotionally versus the other way around. And like, that like was such a shock to my identity because these are core things that I thought about myself and to relinquish that control was really challenging. And like you said, just like, I didn't allow for that fluidity. Like I thought I was failing or like, you know, when you are sick, people tell you, Oh, you're so strong. And it's like, well, I have no choice. Otherwise I'm going to die. Like you don't like feel that, you know, like you don't feel that strength, but yeah, this piece was just really interesting to be like such a shift for me. And then, like you said, to navigate those changes to the self-identity, because I'm not always going to like keep those things that I felt about myself prior to this. And so I appreciate that like fluidity that you're talking about. Like, I think we all need to be like more self-compassionate. Yeah. Well, what, what helped you with that? Like, cause that is, a, that I can imagine that's a yeah. hard shift, like a hard thing to accept about yourself. Yeah. It was really challenging, but I mean, like I said, it, it gave me no choice. Like I had no choice, but to accept the role that I was given. So it was almost like a um, exposure therapy of all the things I thought about myself changing. But instead of like, like I would notice myself apologizing to my husband anytime he had to do something for me or apologizing to my sister for my emotions or to my dad. And then I shifted it to, and every time my, my instinct was to apologize for, for something, I thanked them. Cause that's what I was really trying to say at my core, you know, like I was trying to say, thank you for doing this for me instead of sorry, I'm a burden essentially. And that was really powerful. That shift for me, like that really carried me through the rest of like all of the needing to be taken care of piece. Yeah. I think that's such a, like, I don't know, this idea that you're a burden if you ever need care or help is so ingrained in there too, that you're supposed to be like totally self-sufficient, but you can take care of other people and it's okay for them to need to be taken care of, but like not me. And I don't know. It's interesting. And I think it can like really warp our, yeah, self-perception when that changes, which it will for everyone, even if it's not in this, like drastic a way, like it, what you experienced, you know, like everyone needs to get taken care of. And I don't know if this is the same for you, but for me, like, like I put all of this onto myself always. Like it was never my parents pushing me to strive. Like, I, I don't know if that was your experience, but I'm like, where did this come from? Like, I would be more mad at myself for getting a B than my parents. At, like my parents wouldn't care. <laughs> I definitely got praise for like achievement. And I think that definitely, that played a role in me like tying it to my self-worth. Like, oh, this is the ticket for, you know, belonging and love and all of that. But yeah, I wasn't punished if I didn't, but I punished myself really hard. And that's what I do. And and that's not why, but I think that's one piece of evidence that I think there is sort of a temperament that's kind of predisposed to this. Like there are certain personalities, like, you know, we are all born with a temperament. And I think for some of us, there's, it's just sort of a, we're more at risk of this tendency because I've, I've always been my harshest critic, I think as well. Yeah, I think it's it's a mix, right? Of like probably got some messages that were subconscious that you don't couldn't even pinpoint that really reinforced it, but that someone else might be in the same environment as you and not come away with the same takeaways. So it's like, okay, this is there is a nature component to it, you know. Paul, I think this is a good spot for us to wrap up unless you have any final thoughts for the listeners. I think the only thing, I guess I want to like leave a little hope <laughs> that if you are someone who has this maybe as part of your nature, you have some of these tendencies or you're kind of stuck in that cycle that you feel like you're never doing enough or you're lazy or worthless or undisciplined. I know that I've been there more often than not. And a lot of people I work with have been that this just sort of like, and it's interesting because those are often the people that like to an outside observer or totally total rock stars and just oh my gosh you're doing amazing things that that it's possible to get out of that that like this doesn't have to be the way you live your life and that at the end of the day like you're the only one living your life and you're allowed to enjoy it you're allowed to find it rewarding and meaningful and fulfilling and you deserve that just as much as anybody else that you're not kind of like you were saying Cassie how there's this sometimes it goes along with this like belief that I'm here to take care of other people and serve other people. And their needs 
are totally valid, but mine are not. And that you don't have to perceive yourself that way. You can get out of that and you can get to a place where you do believe that your needs and other people's needs both matter and that you're not just there to like deny yourself pleasure and deny yourself satisfaction and, you know, be a robot who serves everyone else that like you're allowed to have more than that for yourself. Yeah, I really appreciate that one. Like, I think so important for people who struggle like us with this is what I appreciate about your book is that I felt seen by it. Like, I think that's a big component for us to like start on that journey to, to feel like one, we're not alone because other people feel this way too. So thank you so much for talking to me today and for your book. And I, I hope a lot of people listen and, and get so much from this book like I did. Thank you. I hope so too. It's, it's so ironic because I'm I, I'm over here. I like put the, it's so vulnerable to put a book out in the world, and I really do think it can help a lot of people. But I'm also sitting here like, who am I to you know <laughs> tell people how to do this? So I do I do really hope that it it helps a lot of people feel seen and and empowered. Reconnect with what matters, reclaim your mental health, and live by your own rules. Do you strive to have the perfect body, the perfect relationship, the perfect diet and wardrobe, the perfect job, and the perfect life? Have you worked tirelessly at your job, even during illness, so that you can further your career? Do you feel like no matter what, you'll never be as smart, as attractive, or as rich as you'd like? If so, you are far from alone. External influences like social media, wellness culture, and hustle culture pressure us to strive toward unrealistic goals that leave us feeling anxious, burned out, and like we're never enough. Isn't it time we say enough? In this groundbreaking book, clinical psychologist Paula Friedman offers a clear path to help you move beyond toxic striving, the relentless pursuit of perfection, societal ideals, and external validation at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional health, and instead turn inward for guidance. Using a combination of evidence-based tools and strategies grounded in acceptance and commitment therapy and intuitive eating, you'll gain the insight needed to reconnect with your true values, reclaim your physical and mental health, develop unwavering self-compassion and confidence, and live by your own rules. You'll also find profound and practical guidance to identify how and when you stop trusting your own mind, body, and emotions, and started living according to society's standards. Set goals that align with your personal values instead of society's expectations. Develop skills to diffuse from restrictive and self-punishing thoughts so you can be kinder to yourself. Learn how to be an observer of your emotions rather than letting them control you. Stop beating yourself up for gaining weight and view yourself and your body as more than just a perfect selfie. Set effective boundaries with anyone who makes you feel ashamed of yourself for how you look, how much you get done in your day, or anything else. If you're exhausted from the daily grind and fed up with feeling like you aren't enough, it's time to look within yourself. From now on, you are an expert on you. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For over 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Join the New Harbinger Clinicians Club, a free membership club exclusively for mental health professionals. Sign up today and you'll receive a special welcome gift, 35% off all professional books, free client resources, free eBooks throughout the year, access to private sales, a subscription to our quick tips for therapists, email program, and more. Visit newharbinger.com slash clinicians dash club for more information. Do you have an idea for another episode? Do you want to send us a message? Our email address is podcast at newharbinger.com. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast was edited by Jesse Fancushion. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope that you might share it with anyone who could benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.